Welcome to Mark D. Maker. My name's Mark Taylor, and on this project, we'll be carving a little bear. A little cub from the Tom Wolf book, Carving Bears and Bunnies. <clears throat> uh, the reason why I wanted to show you this book is because it's an excellent way for the beginner to really start to um, understand the process of carving and he takes you step by step and and that's just the way he does all of his books literally pictures that show the process along the way of how he does it which if you if you belong to a carving club, you'll you'll get this experience and knowledge. But for those that don't have a carving club in your area, uh, this is a really good way to to get started and to learn. He's got some bunnies that he does. There's a picture of him. A West Virginia born, then moved to uh, North Carolina. And this is, his books have been out for, for quite some time uh, before computers. This is what a lot of the older carvers had as a reference for carving. Now with um, YouTube and, and all that, I mean, you can get instruction and, and, and learn carving. But uh, that's how I learned through the book. Today we're using Tupelo. Tupelo is a southern grown wood. It's it's very light compared to here's a block of basswood and the basswood is twice as heavy as the Tupelo. It's very light. <clears throat> so we'll be putting the bear on the Tupelo and the, the book has the bear at this size but I didn't have a block of wood big enough for him so I shook him down about 80 percent he's about 80 percent of the original size and so that's the size is gonna be so here you can see the ingrain and so the grain orientation what I'm going to do is run the grain orientation up and down. Tom Wolf does the same thing in his book. And the reason is this ear is so small, if the grain orientation came across this way, that would break off so easily. Effortless, it would just, it, it would break off. And same with probably the, the tips of the toes, if the grain orientation went this way so we're gonna run it this way and it's gonna add a little extra strength to the ear um, the very tip of the foot cantered out like that makes this area vulnerable but what you could do is after it's completely carved and burned because you don't want to burn super glue is very thin super glue and let it soak in in the delicate areas that's what i do for the tips of my hummingbird wings um, add strength to them all right so i just laid the pattern on top of the uh, cut out block of wood and traced it on there with an exacto knife i just cut right through the pattern and then back with the pencil and i tell you what when i took this to the bandsaw it cut like styrofoam. I've, I've never cut wood on a bandsaw so effortless. Incredible. Um, here I'm just trying to get a feel for the wood. And it, it feels unlike any wood that I've ever cut before. It, it feels more like a foam or a a composite of some of some sort it's 
extremely light. It's easy to slice, but pushing your knife into it, um, it feels like it would dull it really quick. This is the first time I've used Tupelo. Uh, Tupelo is, is usually used, uh, the bird carvers I know that use Tupelo for their carvings uh, use rotary tool, and I will be using a rotary tool on this. Uh, I'm just experimenting right now with the knife to kind of get a feel for it. Interesting, uh, it's an interesting wood, it's so light. So now that I'm starting to get into some, really doing some cuts, I'm seeing that even with a smooth slicing motion, the wood is left with a rough surface in some areas as if the knife is really dull, but the knife is really sharp. It's like I say, it's unlike any kind of wood I've ever carved with a knife. And I understand now why most people don't knife carve Tupelo. They rotary tool it. And I'll show you here in just a minute when I get my Dremel out, um, what a difference that makes. It does, when using a rotary tool on it, um, very easy to carve. Now carving this kind of feels like carving driftwood. And the thing about driftwood is if you if you carve it it's it's soft, it's light, but it's also got sand in it and it'll dull your knife very quickly. So you see occasionally I stop and I'm checking the sharpness of the blade and uh, just because it feels so much like uh, a driftwood so here we are so far Always remember to do a center line. I put a center line on everything I carve. It ju just helps with uh, knowing where you're at, uh, helping you get to the round when you're doing your carving. Here's one of those, one of those spots that all of a sudden you 
get like into the groove the woods working with you right there oh I could just I could carve all the way through this piece <laughs> right here because it just sounds good it feels good it's carbon nice Right now, all my rotary tool friends, Ben at Studio in the Lake and just Carve Rob and Jordy, Carving Fusion. Uh, here we go. This is a cut saw bit, a tapered cut saw bit. And now I understand why people use rotary carvers for uh, Tupelo carving. It carves really nice with the rotary tool. This cut saw actually looks a whole lot like fur too. Carves these, leaves these little carbide uh, cuts in it that look just like fur. That'll be handy. If you uh, if you're interested in a carbide cutting tool, by the way, both uh, Ben Studio on the Lake and uh, Jordy at Curving Fusion, if you visit them, they have a discount if you buy through their link. So that's that's nice. Now one thing you do want to be careful with is uh, when you're running this is that as you see the bit is slowly inching its way out further and further and I gotta stop and push it back in all the way. Um, the chuck collar that I have is, is hand tightened. It's not tightened with a wrench. Um, it is, is hand tightened and I, and I have that on there so I can change bits quickly. Uh, it's only $10. It is one of the best Dremel accessories you can get. Uh, cause it'll fit any bit and it, changing it from bit to bit is two seconds really quick so if you have a Dremel you want to get this hand tightening bit but uh, when you're running it I'm running this pretty high speed uh, stop occasionally and make sure that bit is all the way in you don't want to run it way out on the edge. It'll come flying out at 30,000 RPM. Now I am wearing a N95 mask while I do this and there is a vacuum running there. You can see my shop vac, a little one, a little shop vac going. But I noticed that this stuff this particular wood just drops right to the ground. It, it is not, um, it is not 
going airborne, I noticed. So this is the first time I'm I'm not familiar with Tupelo and if that's the way it reacts, man, that's that's really nice. Uh, I know if I was doing this with basswood or pine, uh, I would have a cloud around me right now. So that's pretty interesting. All right, I'm getting ready to change bits here in a second. And what I'm going to change over to is a carbide cutter. Here, this is a carbide cutter right there. And I've, I've heard some people refer to this as a stump cutter. And it does a really beautiful job as well. It's a... Uh, it, it leaves less tool marks, for sure. It's, it leaves a smoother surface, and you can also go in with the edge of it and make fine lines, you know, establish where an arm is or whatever. Uh, pretty nice.
All right, I've done a little knife work to him. I took his ears back like he wasn't happy with what he was seeing or he was concerned. Just to add a little bit of expression instead of, you know, kind of making him static. Getting these arms inside here uh, was quite a bit of work with a knife. Um, they still look a little thick. I'm gonna come in with a rotary tool, get back with the rotary tool and um, see what else I can do to them to make them look a little more realistic. Maybe get these pads on his feet more pronounced. Let's get to it. Okay, we got a ruby ball now. I'm gonna take the ruby ball and go in the ear here, kind of hollow that out a little bit. The ruby ball carves very nicely in this. It's very smooth, like butter. So I'll go all around the carving in certain areas, making sure certain areas are rounded out. Here we have a tapered diamond bit. We'll use this for the detail around the feet. Just like drawing with a pencil. Just want to make these areas, these pads on the bottom of the feet a little pronounced. We'll round them out a little bit. Soften the edges. You're going just between the, uh, the toes, carving and cutting the mouth. Hey, let look like he's smiling here. Now switching back to the cut saw bit, tapered cut saw, and I'm going to just kind of unify the surface. The surface is a little rough, and so I'm going to unify it, and this will help also give the illusion of fur. So I'll go over the whole body with this, and that'll give some very light marks and then I'll use a different stone to get deeper texture. The combination will look like fur. You have to be careful keep an eye on that bit. He was trying to come loose on me there. Here is the next bit I'm going to use. Looks like an inverted triangle. And that will allow me to actually go down and do little V cuts practically all around this fur and, and break up 
those small lines with these larger lines and it's now it looks like a combination starting to really read and you view it as fur texture this technique works very well It's really starting to look like fur now. See that there's both light and deep lines. Here's in an area that's uh, the light's coming from the side, so you can uh, really see the texture. All right. Here's a little guy. He used an eye, eye press that I made out of a nail and hollowed out, put a concave on the inside of the nail and just pushed, pushed those eyeballs in, pushed it, twisted it. This wood compresses very easily. Um, it's too low, again. I, know I keep saying that, but it's so different from basswood. I have a feeling this is going to soak up paint very quickly. Um, burnt sienna. Uh, I'm sorry, raw umber and a little bit of burnt sienna. A lot of water. going to be like a, a stain <clears throat> I'm afraid to use that brush it holds so much paint and let's go into this area yeah I was right it's soaking up paint I'm going to do around the muzzle brown. I'll come back and hit the nose and the, uh, the eyes with the black. The eyes, I'm going to use a gloss black. Okay, time for the dark color. It's going to be a, a very dark gray. It's going to be, it's going to come off and read as black. 
ultramarine blue and burnt umber. Mix those two together and you'll have all different shades of gray. You can add white to it, lighten it up. You can add a little more brown to it and you'll have a brownish black or a little more blue to it and you have a bluish black. Very versatile approach to a dark color, especially black. Black doesn't reflect back and uh, in this color will. shiny gloss black for the eyes and the nose. Now I noticed the air dryer kind of made the, the paint chalky looking, kind of dried out. I think it soaked into the ingrain and, and the wood is so light and porous that it just the pigment soaked in and it became lighter so when using Tupelo maybe it's a good idea to seal the wood before you paint it I can always go back and seal it no big deal or just use straight paint on it Just trying to stay within the pressed eye area. I'm letting the paint get down into the crease of the where the eye was pressed. I want it to be as big as possible. Mammals, or at least bears, when they're babies, their eyes look huge because their eyes don't change in size. Their eyes are the same size through their whole life, so their eyes look big. Gives them kind of a cute look. And as they get, the bear gets huge, the eyes start looking real tiny and beady. That looks pretty good. Hit the nose. The uh, where I carved the mouth almost looks like he's smiling. We'll call that done. Please like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.